welcome, Karen. How are you? Oh, if I were any better, I'd be you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful that you are you because there's so much to learn from you. So thank you so much for sharing thank your you. evening it's... with us. My name is Jagrati and I am extremely, extremely delighted to, you know, witness that wonderful speech and doing my research on you has given me so much, so much, so much insight. I mean, I can't even tell you how much I have learned from you. So thank you so much thank for you. that. Thank you so much. You know, all this while, I always thought that knowledge is power. You have given such a fresh perspective that humor is power. For me, because my sense of humor not always goes really down with people. I know it breaks the ice, but it could still break bones. So I would always wonder like, oh my God, I'm, my sense of humor is not always apt. But what you said is seeing humor. That is just so, 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 so wonderful. So thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so you talk, welcome. You talked about your love for zombies. Now that was freaky. <laughs> yes. I get freaked out easily. I can't even imagine being in a town full of zombies and me trying to fight them <laughs> out, you know, for survival. I'm sure given it, you would definitely fight them all out. I'd like to know what hijacks your prefrontal cortex. Is there something that hijacks it? That is a great question um, because there's a lot of times where we find ourselves thinking, what was I thinking? And the fact is that we weren't thinking because our <laughs> brains got hijacked. Um, you know, I think that many times when I have too many things on my plate and I treat everything as a number one priority, um, you can't have more than one number one priority, but many times That's it's like, oh, I'm a superhuman, I can do it, you know? And then what I find is that by giving attention to so many things, my brain gets overwhelmed, mm. it gets tired, it gets hijacked, and then I can't really think. You know, the, the pandemic, I think, mm. over a long period of time, worrying about your family or children or True. loved ones, you know, True. all of those things can, uh, can, hijack. can accumulate. Yeah, hijack. Absolutely. But uh, Dr. Evian Gordon came up with a uh, five different categories of things that hijack the brain. And he calls it the scare method. He's not into zombies, but the scare <laughs> method has to do with the first one has to do with status. You know, are you on a higher status than me? And that could be regarding anything, you know, but it's like, Ooh, that creates a threat. Certainty, lack of certainty. People want to know what to be able to expect, but when we're facing the unknown, whether that's in a pandemic or whether that's in the office, you know, that creates some threat for people's brains. Um, a is autonomy. People don't like to be micromanaged. You know, they like to be able to govern themselves with the appropriate guidance, of course. Um, R is relatedness. People need to feel connected. And when they get disconnected, which again happened a lot in this pandemic, is yes. that um, they were disconnected, brains on fire. And then the last E is equity fairness. You know, I think that you're getting, you know, more attention than I'm getting, or you make more money than I'm getting. And it's like, it's not fair. Throws our brains into a hijack and brains are on fire. And what happens then is that, you know, the people that we're trying to lead, even if we're giving them inspiration, even if we're giving them good guidance, they can't hear us because their brains are on fire. So we have to use these techniques to take down the thermostat, to lower the temperature so that they can be at their best and we can help them become their best. No, absolutely. That's wonderful. But these are all related to a lot of external factors, I feel. Whereas yeah. the solution is mind-based, it's very internal. Now, yes. when you talk about leading with laughter, which is such a fresh leadership perspective, I would say, I've never heard that before. You want us to see funny, you know, yes. not be funny, not worry about being funny, but to see funny. Yes. Wouldn't seeing funny require us to be more present and be more in the now? Would that be the Absolutely. byproduct of it? Absolutely. Because if you are not in the moment, you're going to miss what's going on around you. You don't see the funny signs. You don't hear the funny comments. And, and I like what you said because, you know, those kinds of situations, we are somewhat re relying on the external environment. But sometimes the seeing funny is the internal eye. I have 
a, a collection of stories that I have memorized in my brain that can take me away in an instant. You know, when I'm shopping with my mother and she tips over a huge cooking display, or, you know, when my son puts an M&M up his nose in a movie theater, <laughs> these kinds of things, just sitting there closing my eyes and thinking about that for a moment changes my entire body chemistry, un unlocks my brain and allows me to be my best. It's just because you were mindful in that particular moment while you yes. were with your loved ones, because yes. mindfulness is so important. Oh, it's it, you've hit on a very important point. And I think that people in the past had not made that connection between humor and mindfulness, humor and intention, because many people think that humor is entertainment. And that is one of the purposes. But the other two purposes are influence. How do we persuade? How do we educate? How do we motivate? How do we inspire? And then also well-being is the third purpose. How do we help people be healthier? How do we help them cope? How do we help them be more resilient? How do we help them have a better spiritual experience? All of those things are a part of humor, which is why it's such a well-kept secret. Until now. <laughs> Yay, until now. We're the lucky ones to get the secret out from you. I'd like to know when there is so much crisis around, you know, today we look around, there's so much pain, there's so much loss, yes. there's so much sadness. How can we still see humor in it? I love that question because we assume many times that there isn't humor because the way our brains are designed, our brain's number one job is to protect us, to keep us alive. So it's constantly scanning for threat and it tends to focus on what can hurt us. This goes back to the being mindful, to asking yourself, what am I missing? Because what I can tell you is that the humor is always there. We hmm. just don't necessarily align with it. One of the things that comes to mind is, uh, is Viktor Frankl from the Holocaust who, he, you know, he wrote a wonderful book. If people have not read this book, I always recommend it as one of the top 100 books you should read in your lifetime. And it's called Man's Search for Meaning. But he expressed that humor was such an important part of his surviving the Holocaust. He was in Auschwitz um, for, you know, I think six, seven years. I mean, it was in there for a long time and yet, he was able to find humor even in the concentration camp. And I always think to myself, you know, I'm not having to deal with a concentration camp. My, my issues are not that hard. Quite frankly, over the last five days, I've spent my time um, at a reunion um, as a journalist for um, uh, former POWs of the Vietnam War. Oh. And Many of these men were tortured, they were secluded, they were beaten, and yet they all, 100% of them say that humor was one of the main things that helped them survive. It was dark humor, but the reason for that is the closer we are to tragedy and death, the darker our humor becomes. It's a yes. coping mechanism and it gives us relief even in those darkest of times. Yes. I think Charlie Chaplin is our classic example to what she said, isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. I would I would like to end with my last question, Karen. I could go on and on, but I'll keep it short. I would love short. that. <laughs> <laughs> you have given a 2% solution. You talk about this 2% solution. Can you elaborate more on that, please? Um, a 2% solution, if you're just focusing on incorporating humor in 2% or less of your day. If you do this, two things are key, intentionality and consistency, because these two things, they will totally change your life. If every day, 2% or less of your day, you are intentionally looking for humor or sharing humor or experiencing humor, and you're doing it consistently, whether that's every day, every other day, I recommend several times a day because this um, repeated behavior 
builds up your reserves. It rewires your brain. Neurons that fire together, wire together, according to Hebb's law. And when you do this, we can see the neurological changes, the increase in synapses, the increase in your ability to problem solve, the increase in your ability as a leader to be a visionary. Yeah. These are things that aren't just hype. This is the truth. It's not a secret to you anymore. And I encourage you to really choose humor. Well, absolutely. I'm definitely going to look deeper into the 2% solution and implement it in my day to day life. I would just like to end that in our Vedic philosophy, there's a saying that when you're born, you cry, you're born, you know, as a crying baby, but through your years, of involvement as a soul, you have to ensure that when you die, you die with a smile on your face. I and I think that's what that. you're teaching us to do. I think that's what you're teaching us to do, to find humor, to see funny, even in death, to see funny. Thank you yes. so much. I, I enjoyed you. this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> Bye. Take care.